And that man died for you. He paid, he said, I am the bread, uh, that he said um, in John chapter 6, uh, I am that bread of life, verse 48, your fathers that eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This, talking about himself, is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So when you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, that's, that's what the communion pictures. When you take that unleavened bread, you're, that's picturing receiving the, the body that was, uh, was slain for you, was crucified for you, to remind you of that. He said, as often as you do this, you, you show my death. And that's what he did. He died for you. And, when, and, and you, as a Christian, you have received that death. The Bible said, to as many as received him, you believed on that death to pay for your sins. You reject your righteousness. You believe in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So Christ is our unleavened bread. So they were to have the Passover, picturing the death of Christ. They were to have the feast of unleavened bread, which was to picture the pure, perfect, sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they were also, in Leviticus 23, to have at that same time of the year a feast of first fruits. Uh, really, uh, if you really want to uh, draw the perfect types of these things, the Passover pictures his death and the shedding of his blood. The unleavened bread pictures the body that was slain and buried and the first fruits pictures the resurrection. And that's the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. You see, the reason I know that the uh, unleavened bread pictures the death is because in the book of Acts, when it talks about Jesus Christ, it says, David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave, thy, leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. His flesh did not corrupt in the grave, because it was unleavened. The reason you and I have a problem with uh, corrupting, Paul talks about this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Your flesh is corrupting. Don't take care of it. Just let it go for about a week or two. See how you smell and how you feel and how you look. Amen? Amen? It is corrupted. And eventually, the ultimate corruption is death. They don't take it long to decompose. They put all that formaldehyde and all that other junk in it as much as they want. Uh, the Egyptians might do the best they can to mummify, you know, and that might, that might reframe that. You see, man's always trying to turn around what God said is going to happen. And they can try all that business, but brother, sooner or later... The air will get to it, the coverings will come apart, and the air will get to that body, and it'll decompose, just like God said. And uh, Christ pictures the, the, the feast, the first set of feasts picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, I think it's in Romans where, I think it's in Romans chapter 8. Uh, Paul talks about... Uh, let me think now. Let me see here. In respect to the first fruits, how it, how it um, relates to the resurrection. There it is. Uh, Romans 8, 20, uh, 3. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. They're the first fruits of the Spirit. It's connected with the resurrection. There is something in me that the Holy Spirit did at conversion that guarantees that I'm going to come up from the grave. I have the first fruits of the Spirit. There is within me an eternal seed. You see, you can bury me, but I'm not going to stay down. Because I have, I have my Passover. Uh, I have taken of the unleavened bread. Therefore, this corruptible may put on corruption, but eventually it's going to put on incorruption. Yeah. Or, you know, it may continue to corrupt, but one day that seed is going to bring forth everlasting life and a brand new body. 
Those were the first three sets of feasts. They took place in the first month of the year, uh, of the Jewish the religious year, and they pictured the first coming of Jesus Christ. The next feast is in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. Then he said, uh, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow. Now, from the morrow would be the next day after a Sabbath day. Uh, and that would have been the first day of the week. You shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. See? Uh, after the Sabbath day, which was Saturday. From that, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Forty-nine days. Seven, seven times seven. Seven Sabbaths will pass. Forty-nine days. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days. And ye shall offer... Uh, a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now, this was the Feast of Pentecost. That's what Penta is, uh, five, or in this case, it's 50. Ye shall bring out of your habitation two wave loaves uh, of two tenths deals. Uh, they shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. You see, there's no leaven in the Feast of the Passover or unleavened bread, or first fruits. They, they were not allowed to use any leaven at all. And the reason being is because the first three feasts picture the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the complete gospel is shown in those feasts. And they speak of Christ's death force at his first coming. Therefore, leaven was not to be used because leaven in the Bible always pictures it either pictures sin or false doctrine or a worldly, like I told you, worldly living, worldly attitude. Uh, therefore, Christ being unleavened, the first three feasts were not to use leaven. But the Feast of Pentecost, they were to bake their wave loaf with leaven. This was the only feast in which leaven was, was allowed to be used. And... Um, now, here's where a lot of Baptists really get themselves into a real pickle. They destroy what the Feast of Pentecost really speaks of. Uh, they are, look at this, uh, and they shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And remember what I read to you back there in Romans, the Christian who is born again in this age is the first fruits of the Spirit. There was, there was, in the Old Testament, no real first fruits of the Spirit. There was no spiritual resurrection back there of a believer. There was no spiritual uh, birth back there. A fruit of a woman is their children. The fruit of the womb, you know, you've heard the expression, the fruit of the womb? I almost said the fruit of the loom, amen. <laughs> <laughs> but the fruit of the womb is a, is a child, and the fruit of the Holy Spirit is birth or new life, which the resurrection also speaks of. Pentecost, the next feast, 50 days later, speaks of the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit to regenerate a people which had never been true up until that time. And here's where the Baptists just run every direction. It's almost, you ever, you ever remember any years ago, uh, the railroad yards used to have a, uh, a turntable. And that thing would had different uh, tracks that that train would go out on, and that turntable would put that locomotive on what track. And that track, that yard, you got all those tracks running in every different direction. That reminds me a lot of the Baptists. You know, just going off in every different direction. And a lot of it is they don't really understand the spiritual principles of the church. The average Baptist could not tell you when the church began. They haven't got any idea. Uh, I've got newspapers at home. I read you one here just not too long ago about a guy that said, you know, it began with John the Baptist. Now, I'm not, I'm not confusing the local church with the body of Jesus Christ, the spiritual body. You see, that's their problem. They can't make that distinction. They know there was a church before Pentecost. I do too, man. 
Acts chapter 7 says there's one back in the wilderness when Israel's in the wilderness 2,000 years before John the Baptist or 1,500 years before John the Baptist ever stepped on the scene. So I'm not, you know, they talk about, you know, starting to John the Baptist. Hey, if you're going to talk about the local church, you better get back to Moses. Uh, you're, you're a heretic. You think John the Baptist was the first pastor of a church. Moses technically is the first pastor. The first time the word church is used is in relation to the nation of Israel in the wilderness. So, you know, learn a little bit more about your roots. That's the local church. That's the physical assembly. But when it comes to a spiritual assembly, when it comes to, and, you know, I know when I say this, I'm talking to people that have no idea, no concept at all what I'm talking about, so I just do it for the ones that do understand. The rest of you just need to really, you either need, you need to get saved. The Bible said the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. When you begin to talk about the spiritual body of Christ, folks look at you like, well, what's he talking about? All I can say is that when I got saved, May the 19th, 1968, the Holy Spirit took up residence inside of me. The Bible says, know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Most Christians don't know that. They really don't. I mean, you know what? You couldn't live like some, some folks live and really believe God's inside all the time. If, hey, hey, if you, if you really believe that you were taking God some of the places you take him, you wouldn't go there. Amen. You don't believe he's in there. You believe he's in here. You think, you, you know, on Sunday you come, and you come and say hi to God. No, hey, if you're saved, man, he's riding with you. And he's not supposed to be the co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. That, boy, that's true. <laughs> that's true, brother. You know, every now and then you say, take the wheel. But most of the time, I've heard men say it. I, I, can't, I don't like to ride with people. You know, I've heard men say, I like to drive. They want to control. Well, anyway, get off that. Um, go, go to the book of Acts now, chapter 2. What does Pentecost, or the Feast of Pentecost, truly represent or rule, truly speak of. You see, all the things that were written back there were written for types and illustrations and pictures of spiritual realities. The Passover, the first fruits, and the uh, uh, unleavened bread feast were to picture the, the truths and the realities of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were but mere pictures of something that... Look, I have... Uh, I have... Uh, pictures of my children in here pictures of my family in my in in my wallet uh good grief <laughs> i don't have a picture of my wife in here boy that's bad isn't it i thought i had a, at one time i had a picture of my whole family in here my goodness must have fell out huh <laughs> well hallelujah anyway there's a there's a just there's a picture of my little daughter my, my daughter Deborah, but you see that's just a picture that's not the real thing. The real thing is sitting in a classroom downstairs. See that's the difference. The Old Testament stories and the Old Testament doctrines were but pictures of something that was to be real later on. In other words, God wanted to show the Old Testament Jew what He was going to do. That's why John the Baptist. Oh, boy, I, I, I better be careful here. That's why John the Baptist said, I truly baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. You see, before Calvary, water baptism was, was a figure of something that was going to happen. After Calvary, it's a figure of something that has happened. Everything is in relation to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So everything before the crucifixion was a picture of what would take place at the, at, in the ministry of Jesus Christ and the, all the prophets in the Old Testament, all the law in the Old You read it in, in Romans chapter 3, the prophets and the law uh, reveal Jesus Christ. They reveal the glory of God. Romans chapter 3 says that. Uh, I'll, I'll read it to you. Romans chapter 3 says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Everything back there, everything, just like these lights right here, uh, uh, attempt to reveal the speaker. Everything in the Old Testament, the prophets, were at lights to reveal the ministry of Jesus Christ and the, uh, the work of Jesus Christ. The law, everything back there was a picture of him, his life, his work, his death, uh, and all of that. So uh, when you study the feast, you're studying something that's to reveal or to picture a reality yet to come. Uh, so therefore, the Feast of Pentecost. Now I go to the book of Acts. The Feast of Pentecost was to picture the beginning of something that's leavened. And also, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to forget it. Also, in connection with the statement first fruit, he said, "You have two wave loaves of two tenths deal, a two tenths deal. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruit unto the Lord." Uh, and then there were also, strangely enough. Ten different animals that were to be offered, and if you know anything about Bible numerology, ten is the number of what in the Bible? Gentiles. It had to do with the Gentiles. It had to do with the first fruit. It had to do with leaven. You get in the picture, and then if you really, if you really understand what be, what happened on the day of Pentecost, you really will get the picture. Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. Now, where the Pentecostal Church and the Holiness Brethren and the Charismatic groups bow up like the Baptist is misunderstanding Acts chapter 2. They try to repeat the Pentecostal experience of Acts chapter 2 over and over and over again. The Baptists disregard it because they don't know how to handle what happened there. The Pentecostals jump in on it and try to uh, utilize it to substantiate their position, and they try to recreate it over and over and over again. But folks, from the time that this takes place in Acts 2 till the end of the book of Acts, it is never repeated again in history. There is never another Pentecost like the one you read about in Acts 2. You see what the Roman Catholic Church does, they try to repeat the sacrifice of Jesus Christ every Sunday. There was only one sacrifice. There was only one Pentecost. The Bible said, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing. You've got to divide between what's real and what's pictured. The feast of pictures. The uh, baptism is a picture. The light figure. Communion is a figure. Those things are not the real things. They're to be done as a picture of things either to happen or things that are gone, uh, that have happened. You see what the what, what the devil does is he can he confuses people. God's not the author of confusion, but he'll confuse you to 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 make something real out of the picture. That's exactly what the Jews did. They they tried to make the laws and the feasts their salvation. That, that, no 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 no. Those things were given to them to picture what their salvation was going to be in. Now, what, is the, what, what do we do? We take baptism and communion and try to make them the real thing. They're not the real thing. They're but a picture of the real thing. You see how sly the devil is? And he'll use scripture to damn you. And he'll use things that picture the real thing to get you to think that that's where salvation is. No, they, they just picture the real thing. Don't get stuck with a two substitute. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 50 days after the Passover, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, you know it wasn't a Baptist church. <laughs> it's never been a Baptist church that was all in one accord and all of them at one place at one time. Amen? So you can't, you know, people try to get the Baptists all the way back to John the Baptist. Hey, they only make it to Acts 2. I mean, 
<laughs> you haven't got a Baptist church. Well, anyway. Uh, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. As. You see, there came a sound from heaven that's as a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't a rushing mighty wind that came from heaven. It was as. You see how important the two-letter word is and how messed up people can be? As of a rushing mighty wind, and it, the sound, filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. Wasn't fire. When the Pentecostal talks about getting the baptism of fire, he doesn't have any idea what in the world he's talking about. He's quoting some other yokel that got up and said, this is what you need to have, and I got it, you know, and he demonstrates it by, uh, <gasps> or, you know, I don't know, hiccuping about every 15 seconds or uh, lengthening legs and, you know, reducing goiters and all that business, supposedly. Like as a fire, and it, a tongue. See, cloven tongues came in there, but it, a tongue, sat upon each of them. When that thing comes in the room, it's a cloven, it's cloven tongue. You know what the word cloven is? It's the word for split or divided. To cleave is to divide. When that thing comes in, whatever it is that comes in that room, when it comes in there, it's, it's like this, it's divided tongue. And when it gets into that room, each of those tongues sits on one of those apostles. Therefore, each of the apostles speak in an unknown tongue. Now, isn't that simple? It's amazing what you can do if you just read what it says. And it sat upon each of them. There are 12 apostles in there. When you read the rest of the passage, they're the only ones working miracles. And, they're, uh, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. All right, now where it says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. All right, go back to chapter one. And notice what Jesus Christ promised right before he ascended up to heaven. In Acts chapter one, verse five. <clears throat> The verse 4, and being assembled together with them, the apostles, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, something God had promised to Israel. What you want to write down there is Ezekiel 36. What God promised to the nation of Israel was the Holy Spirit, and also in Joel chapter 2, the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he said, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. He told him, he told him that in John 14, John 16. He told him that after he left, the Holy Spirit would come to them. But remember now, it's the Holy Spirit that produces the first fruits. We read that in Romans chapter 8. For John truly baptized with water, that was a figure, and it was a true baptism, because that's all there was at that time. He truly baptized water. John's baptism wasn't wrong. There wasn't anything wrong with John's baptism. That's all there was. So John truly baptized with water. But ye shall. Is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? It is future tense, is it not? Did not John say, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me shall. What's that? That's future, isn't it? All right. John said, in the future, Jesus Christ will baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now, that promise was specifically for the nation of Israel, and that promise has never yet to be fulfilled because they rejected the, they rejected the baptizer. They rejected John as the forerunner, and they rejected Jesus Christ as the one who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit. So because they reject 
God then manifests that baptism to a few Jewish apostles and believers to try to get Israel again to accept the gospel of the kingdom, which they reject again in the early part of the book of Acts. And because of that, God sets Israel aside, Romans chapter 11, and says, Okay, okay here, I'm going to take your promise and your blessing that I intended to give you as a nation, and I'm going to give it to those that were not a people, Gentiles. And the blessing and the promise that was to be Israel then is, is opened up to the Gentiles. That's what Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10 will reveal to you if you'll take a little time to study. Nobody had any concept of the Jews that the Gentiles would ever get in on the Holy Ghost. Because to them, a Gentile was a dog, and the Holy Ghost would never touch a dog. And you know how God convinced the Jew that the Gentile got the Holy Ghost? The Jew in Acts, or the Gentile in Acts 10 speaks in tongues just like the Jews speak in tongues in Acts 2. And that convinced Peter and the other apostles that God had now given the Holy Ghost to Gentiles. But that giving of the Holy Ghost begins in Acts 2 as a baptism. And it's also said to be a filling. Therefore, when a person gets saved, when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll find this in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, for we are all children, the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. We've all been baptized into one body. A, when a person receives the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and puts faith in Him, a number of things take place. Number one, that person is born again. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. To as many as you see into them, give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, nor of blood, but of God. A new birth takes place. First fruit, the fruit of the womb. The Holy Spirit begins to birth children in Acts chapter 2. And people say, you mean nobody in the Old Testament was born again? Amen. That it dawned on you. You say, well, what happened to them? God justified them by a temporary system called the First Testament. And because it was a temporary system, when they died, they didn't go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom, Luke 16. And, that, and to wait for the promise of eternal redemption and an eternal inheritance. If you study Hebrews, you see, that's the whole problem. Christians know so little about the Bible, they don't have any idea what in the world is going on. They don't, they don't know why they're the Baptists all believe all these different things. Uh, there is so many ways you can get fouled up. If you don't study that Bible and write it about that Bible and spend some time in that Bible and get your hide in a pew somewhere and sit down a while and listen to somebody that knows something and just shut one in your mouth and listen, you'll finally, one of these days, quit making a mess out of your life and your home and your children. I mean, we are in apostasy. That is a falling away from the truth. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence, and it happens in Acts 2. All right, what does the baptism of the Holy Ghost do? Go to Acts chapter 5. Therefore, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, is to picture the beginning of the church. Remember what it said about leaven. Because that was the one feast that leaven was to be used in. Why was leaven used in that feast? Because God was trying to tell you that there will be leaven in the church. All right, what's leaven? Beware the leaven of the Pharisees of false doctrine. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose about 70 or 80 or 90 percent of you right now. But if you, ha if you know anything about the early part of the book of Acts, Tongues, healings, resurrections, signs and wonders to the nation of Israel, the gospel of the kingdom being preached, folks not getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost until they go underwater or until an apostle. I mean, you, you talk about wild doctrine. 
You want to start you a church, all you need is Acts 2 to 10, you can create you anything. Acts 2 to 10, you can create any kind of denomination or any kind of faith. You can lead everybody astray. It's all there. And if that doesn't, you know, if that doesn't get you Acts, try 19. That'll get the rest. In the beginning of the church, because of the foreknowledge of God, God knew in his attempt to deal with Israel that there would be signs and wonders, the continuation of John's baptism of repentance, there would be the gospel of the kingdom, but you see, that's all false doctrine for us. So he said, bake it with leaven, because when it begins, it's going to begin with leaven. Amen. I mean, on the foreknowledge of God. And then what happens? In Acts chapter 10, Peter gets his act straightened out. God says, I'm no longer going to, I'm no longer headed toward Israel. I'm now headed toward the Gentiles. They have rejected. Paul gets say, uh, they, the, uh, the Jews killed Stephen. They killed Stephen in Acts chapter 7. God runs everybody out of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 8. And no more miracles are ever worked in Jerusalem from that time forward. In Acts chapter 9, he saves a short little Jew that he's planted on the center of the Gentiles. And in Acts chapter 10, he has this thing come down out of heaven to show this, this Jewish apostle who's an apostle to the Jews that now what God hath cleansed, he's not to call unclean. What's all that for? Man, you're in the biggest transition period you ever saw. You're in the biggest changeover. You're going from Jewish apostles to Gentile apostles. You're going from the gospel of the kingdom to the gospel of the grace of God. You're going from signs and wonders to the completion of a, of a book that replaces the signs and wonders. You're going from an emphasis on Israel to an emphasis on the church. And everybody gets bombed out in Acts. I like the way Dr. Ruckman spells it, A-X. That's right, boy, it'll kill you. It'll ax your spiritual life and it, it completely cut it off. You listen to a bunch of these, uh, you know, uh, crazy Baptists, get, you know, starting you back. Oh. Man, Pentecost is the birthday of the church, that, the spiritual body. I'm not talking about the local body. I realize there's local bodies before that. Now, I'm not in difference. Uh, we had a preacher here recently. Who was it this week? It was Brother Keene. But what he was talking about was the local church. He wasn't talking about the body of Christ. Uh, I don't even know where I have... Five, Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. Now, you go through the book of Acts, folks. It's always the apostles that are working the signs and wonders or they're present when the signs and wonders are worked or somebody they've laid hands on is working the signs and wonders, and that only happens twice. You don't create doctrine on isolated events in a transition period. You don't want to... Your doctrine is established in Romans to Philemon, and you can properly judge and properly divide the book of Acts by Romans to Philemon. But if you start in Acts, you'll mess up Romans to Philemon. You never will understand Romans to find. You have people losing their salvation. You have people, uh, you have people getting baptized to get salvation, join the church. Get, uh, you have all kinds of heresy. Now notice, verse uh, 14, and believers, and believers were the more added to what? Well, how do believers get added to the Lord? Now go back to Acts chapter 2 and notice what said the believers were added to there. It's a matter of uh, elimination. When you eliminate what it can't be, you get down to what it has to be. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, they were praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added, look at that same expression, added to the what? All right. Whatever's taking place with this, he said in Acts 1, you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. In Acts 2, they were all filled and they were added to the church. And it says in Acts 5, they were added to the Lord. Now turn to, now turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and notice that whether a person ever gets in a local church or not is not truly the eternal issue. The, the eternal issue is, did you ever get into the Lord and His church? I mean, that's, man, that's the issue. I mean, I, I, 
You want every Christian to be in a local church where they can grow spiritually and produce more Christians. But if they don't, if all they ever get is get saved, that's enough to get them in the church and get them in the Lord, and that'll, that'll take care of eternity. And really, eternity is the, is the primary thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit, he should be baptized by the Holy Ghost, by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, the spiritual baptism begins that baptizes every believer into one spiritual body. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1. If you wonder why I'm quoting a lot of verses, is that my opinion is worthless. It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what this blessed book says. And that's the problem with Christians. They listen to too stinking much opinion. Opinions will get you into trouble. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, talking about God and His Son, He, uh, uh, in verse 20, he, which He wrought, which God wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His right hand above in the heavenly places, far above principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named in this world and the one to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him, gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church which is his body. For by one spirit we all baptize into one body. Ephesians 4 says there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one body, one hope, one God. You see, all of those things refer to the baptism of the Holy Spirit that began in Acts chapter 2 that was never previous to Acts 2 because Jesus said, John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And everybody that was baptized with the Holy Ghost in Acts 2 was added to the church, added to the Lord, which is his body, which is a spiritual church. There is a spiritual church. Even you don't belong to Charity Baptist Church this morning, if you are saved and born again, you are in that spiritual body. I'm in that spiritual body. We may not be in the same local church, but if you're really saved, we're in the same spiritual church. And one day we'll all meet in heaven. We'll all get called out, and there'll be, a, there'll be the assembly meeting up there. All right? The Feast of Pentecost was to picture that. Now, the last three feasts are tabernacles, trumpets, and atonement. What do they picture? Well, the first three picture the first coming, the work of Christ in the work of salvation, redemption, death, burial, and resurrection. Without that, forget everything else. Without that, you can forget everything else. Without that, there is no church. Without that, there is no need for a second coming. Okay? Everything is based upon the first, the Passover. That is the basis of all eternal promises of God. The second three feasts, tabernacles, was to picture God tabernacling in the flesh with man. But you see, he didn't, he didn't do that at the first coming. Uh, in, his, in the fullness of what he desired to do, he did tabernacle in the flesh, but who saw him? How many people really tabernacled with him? How many people really fellowshiped with him? It's a very limited group. He never got beyond 30 miles from where he was born. You understand what I'm saying? He did tabernacle in the flesh for 33 years on the face of this earth, but it was completely limited and restricted. The Feast of Tabernacles wasn't to picture a res restricted fellowship with man. The Tabernacles was to picture a, a, the fullness of God's tabernacling with man. I mean, every man having access to him. How many men had access to God in the Old Testament? Ah, man, yeah, during the law, one, the high priest. He got in there one day a year. I'm sure that made him king on, you know, king of the hill, but it was pretty limited. And he better not go in there without blood. 
and he better not go in there without those robes on. It's completely limited. Then Jesus Christ shows up, that manifestation or that tabernacling increases. But it's just to a few select people that actually get to fellowship with him. Then he dies on Calvary. He goes back. He said, I, he said, I must go back. He said, then the Father will send the Comforter, and he'll abide with you. Now, the believer fellowships directly with God. Every believer di fellowships directly with God. Amen. And, uh, and one day, we're going to, all of us are going to go up to heaven, and we'll, we'll fellowship with him directly. One day, he's coming back at the second coming, and for 1,000 years, he'll be literally at Jerusalem. But even during the millennium, fellowship with man is limited. It's not until eternity where God truly, it says that there's no temple there because he is the temple. He then will tabernacle with all men because in eternity, there'll be, there'll be no unrighteousness. There'll be no sin. There'll be no... Nothing that God... You see, God can't dwell with sin. He cannot dwell with it. All right? Tabernacles was to picture God fulfilling His desire. How did the Bible start out? What was God doing in the, in the garden? Hmm? His fellowship with man, wasn't it? He's walking and talking with Adam and Eve. Fellowship with him just like you and I. What happened after that? They were banished. What God's been doing ever since then is trying to reestablish that perfect fellowship. Tabernacles, just to picture that. You see, you and I dwell in the tabernacle. God wants to dwell in the tabernacle that he might tabernacle with man. He, oh, well, anyway. Um, that will, that will uh, begin with the millennium when he returns. You'll find that he returns in Revelation chapter 19. The millennial reign, the 1,000-year reign, begins in Revelation 20. I don't know why some people can't accept that. It does say in Revelation 19 that he does return and he destroys the armies of this world. And the Bible says in Revelation 11:15, 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Now, he just isn't going to take over spiritually, honey. He's going to take over literally. Ain't going to be any elections in the millennium. Amen. Ain't going to be any politicians in the millennium. Ain't that going to be a blessing? Amen. What will you argue about then? Uh, he'll, he'll come back. Then also at that same time in Leviticus 23, there was the Feast of Atonement. Now turn to uh, Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, verse 21. God is determined to atone for the sins of Israel. Now, you and I are important, and the church is important in relation to Jesus Christ. But in relation to God the Father, the deal is Israel. If you think you're so important, uh, you know, up until about 50 years ago, Bible preachers got a lot of space in newspapers. And every community was dependent upon its churches. The church was a major factor in the lives of the English-speaking people, the Gentile people. But how about now? What's in the newspapers today? It's, yes. But what's the emphasis in the newspaper? It's the Mideast. It's Israel. What used to be an emphasis in the world on the doings of the church has been set aside and God is beginning to fulfill his eternal purpose in a people of Abraham. You need to read Romans 11 real careful, real close. You think you and I, we are something. Uh, we're just branches that were, we're wild olive branches grafted in. We're wild. You want to see what you, you, want, you want to see what you're like? Study the, uh, study England, the history of England, the barbarians, the Norsemen. Study that crowd. I mean, they cut one another up, meet one another. That's your bunch. 
You're a bunch of the Druids sacrificing human people. The Jews, the Jews knew better than that. <clears throat> but they did get involved in that, but that's not, that's not their heritage. You see, God gave them some things in the Old Testament no, no Gentile ever had. Your, your past and my past is pretty rugged looking. We're wild. And one of these days, God's going to <clears throat> reestablish that original fruit, the first, the, uh, the nation of Israel. And in Joel chapter 3, verse 21, it says, <clears throat> notice in verse 20, But Judah shall dwell forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. One day God is going to atone for the sin of Israel. He, uh, and if you want to write down Daniel chapter 9, I think it's Daniel chapter 9, one day God is going to cleanse the temple. God is going to cleanse the, uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. When all that comes to pass, God is going to atone for Israel. That hasn't happened yet. So the Feast of Tabernacles is God dwelling with his people. Atonement is to a picture the day or the time when God would atone for his people Israel. And the other feast, the last one, the seventh one, which came at the same time, the seventh month. By the way, these last three feasts come in the seventh month. <clears throat> Therefore, any time God comes to tabernacle in the flesh, it's going to be in relation to those three feasts. And you have the times of the first and second coming right there. I can't tell you what year. can't tell you what day. I don't know the year, don't know the day or the hour, but I know the times and seasons. First, Corinthians, First Thessalonians chapter 5. People say, well, you can't know that. Well, you may not be able to, but I'm not that dumb. Uh, the other set of feasts came at the seventh month are the Feast of Trumpets. If you want to know what they speak of, read the book of Revelation, the trumpets. You'll find the trumpet judgments in the book of Revelation. You want to see a type of it in the Old Testament? Study Joshua's taking of the cursed city. It pictures the second coming when Jesus Christ will destroy Babylon, the cursed city, at the time of the trumpets. The first set of feasts picture the first coming of Jesus Christ. The, the second, uh, well, there really isn't a group on the second one. The second, uh, at the second time of the year, which was 50 days after, you have one feast, Pentecost, which pictures the church, the beginning of the body of Christ. The third set of feasts, again, go back to the emphasis on Israel, the atonement for Israel, tabernacling the flesh, God with the nation of Israel. He, in, in the millennium, he's going to be their prince and their high priest and their king, and he will sit in Jerusalem. I believe it's Revel, uh, Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 21 to 24. And he will rule over them. And David will also rule over them. You'll find that in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, then the trumpets are to picture the time of that thing. It's at, uh, according to the book of Revelation. And atonement is for Israel. Therefore, the feasts picture all the major prophetic events that take place in history. In relation to Israel, in relation to the church, the first coming, the second coming. All the resurrections, by the way, turn last of all to Deuteronomy 16, 16. If you want to know what time of the year the resurrections take place, study the feasts. If you know what time the feasts take place, you'll know what time the resurrections take place. We've already gone through this in a study here recently on the resurrections. <coughs> but in Deuteronomy 16, 16, it, said, uh, it says something like, that three times in a year shall all the males appear before me in the place that I have determined or I have set. Isn't that what it says, something like that? Three times in a year? All right. Those three times that all the males were to appear before God was at the time of Passover, the time of Pentecost, and the time of Tabernacles. Three times a year that Jew, if he could, was to come up to Jerusalem where God was. And that pictured something. That was to picture the three, the three parts of the first resurrection when all the males 
Matthew chapter 22, will appear before him in the real Jerusalem. Just as that Jew came up year after year, why did that Jew have a Sabbath week after week and year after year to picture the millennial Sabbath? Why did they come up year after year to picture somebody actually, literally coming up before God to the real Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem? So when Jesus Christ rose from the dead, Matthew 27, 51, it said, many of the body of the saints which slept arose. First group of males come up and they go up, they go up to heaven, appear before God. You and I go up at Pentecost and the, tri uh, the, tribulation, the tribulation saint goes up at the, close to the time of the second coming around tabernacles. Three times all the males go up. If you're in the first resurrection, you might have long hair and a pretty face now, but one of these days you're going to get a body of a man. I know you don't like that, and folks say, oh, I don't believe all that. It doesn't matter what you believe. Matthew 22 says in the resurrection they shall be as the angels. Amen. You and I are in the resurrection. Amen. Amen. You wouldn't want to be in subjection to your husband for eternity, would you, sis? <clears throat> okay. Let's take a break. Boy, I went way over time.